Greetings and welcome to the Cancer Interviews podcast. What I am is Bruce Morton, your host. What I am not is a doctor or a scientist. So when I tell you a biomarker is a way to detect disease or infection, I am perhaps, perhaps grossly oversimplifying. But on this episode, our guest is a doctor and he can explain biomarkers in a way that is simple and cogent and relevant. He is Whitney Jones, MD. He's the founder of the Colon Cancer Prevention Project in Louisville, Kentucky. This is his second appearance on Cancer Interviews. So Whitney, welcome back. Hey, Bruce, great to see you and good morning. And uh, I also want to make sure I do a disclosure. I am a employee and have equity in, uh, and work for a company called Grail that works in the biomarker space. So, uh, but again, this is a broad view, but thanks so much for having me. All right, now I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to ask you to take off your doctor hat and put on your layperson hat and explain to our viewers and listeners just what is a biomarker. Well, a biomarker is a hugely broad category. And uh, in terms of what they are, they're usually either uh, proteins or segments of DNA or associations of DNA, such as RNA, uh, which are the parts of DNA that help code for proteins that can be found in people's blood, in people's urine, in people's sputum. They can get them from tissue or tumor specimens. Uh, and so there's a broad variety, even in central uh, cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, and so huge, uh, broad amount of these. And what they're used for is to uh, both evaluate for the presence of disease uh, and, and primarily used in cancer, but can also be used, in, as you said, in infectious diseases, uh, even heart disease, uh, diabetes, risk factor issues. Uh, but also uh, primarily are used in, in cancer. And that tells us about people's risk for cancer. It tells us about uh, what type of tumor a person has and what potential therapies it might be amenable to, as well as people who have a known cancer to evaluate for precision oncology opportunities to treat it with certain medications, as well as follow it longitudinally during the course of treatment for those who have cancer. So biomarkers is a relatively small word that covers a huge area for folks. But an example of that might be PSA, which is a protein, prostate-specific antigen. That's gonna be one that most folks have heard of, uh, as well as gene testing, people who undergo hereditary cancer risk assessment for their risk of cancer and certain genes that they carry. Those are both examples of biomarkers. You had mentioned the word buried in all this, medication. What role do biomarkers play in terms of whether a new drug passes clinical trials and hits the market? Well, I think they're being used more and more, and the, 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 the utilization within the trials now uh, are just beginning because this technology is relatively new. Most biomarkers have been used for prognostication, but lately we've gotten into immunotherapy and, for instance, treatment with advanced lung cancer, and we're looking for epidermal growth factor uh, markers in tumors and then utilizing that, uh, that marker, that expression of that uh, in order to design different therapies around that. So, yes, they're being used now in clinical trials. Another one is Plavix. Certain people carry a gene that makes Plavix uh, ineffective. Uh, and, and so, you know, those folks are not appropriately uh, treated with Plavix. And so uh, it's really spanning the entire spectrum. And if I can, I want to go into why particularly the genomic pieces of this have become so relevant lately. And it's because the ability to sequence DNA deeply and cheaply has, has exponentially uh, increased. It's sort of like computing power. You think of what we could do with computers 20 years ago versus what we have now. Well, that same impact has occurred in the DNA sequencing uh, 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 territory to where we can sequence and find DNA to a much greater degree, much more inexpensively as well than we ever did before. It sounds like the biomarker in a way is a form of scrutiny, but is there any scrutiny of the biomarker? Well, a, a lot of biomarkers absolutely have undergone scrutiny. And again, we see them in common utilization today. 
If a person has a history of breast cancer, then, you know, evaluating their underlying genetics for mutations is, is considered standard. Uh, certainly, we've had missteps in uh, biomarkers, and PSA is the perfect example of that, where there were many things that caused elevation of PSA, including prostatitis, uh, just age-related issues, and we sort of probably overused that in diagnosing people with prostate cancer, and I think certain people underwent uh, unnecessary surgery because prostate cancer is a quite an indolent uh, issue in many people. So yes, I think biomarkers is new, but I think any new technology is undergoing ongoing scrutiny and, and what we would call an adoptive uh, and adaptive process where we're learning as we're uh, discovering. And again, you know, waiting 15 years, I think we learned from the COVID experience that we can accelerate uh, much more aggressively when we identify opportunities. And remember, we have a COVID-sized epidemic every single year in the United States with cancer deaths. All of this sounds like it can have good outcomes, but it sounds like it is taking place on the playing field, if you will, while the layperson, like me, is in the last row of the bleachers. How can biomarkers be made to be re relevant for the layperson? Well, I think the most important thing is that people who are trying to understand and deal with their cancer risk or dealing with cancer have a connection to their physicians, right? Your physicians are reading literature that's appropriate. They're looking at guidelines. They're looking at evolving technology. Uh, and, and again, people who treat cancer, this is part of their daily read now. This is no longer you know, something that's in the future for them. This is part of the therapy that's evolving right in front of their eyes. And again, we're very quick to develop new therapies and treatments for cancer. What takes a much longer time are those uh, biomarker utilizations in either predicting cancer or detecting cancer early. Those take much longer time in order to develop those studies. So my big recommendation to your listeners is to not only do your your internet research with Dr. Google, but have those decisions and discussions with your doctors who can help put that into perspective for you. You talked about computers 20 years ago, computers today. One can only imagine what computers can do, say, 20 years from now. Let's extrapolate that dynamic to biomarkers. As exciting as the progress can be that biomarkers have made, what's your vision for uh, 10, 20 years from now? Well, my personal vision, uh, and again, this isn't representing Grail's vision, I think that a lot of screening tests for cancers, and I'm gonna stay in the cancer uh, swim lane because that's where I have the most experience. I, I think we will find that many blood tests are suitable uh, for uh, some of the current things we already screen for, particularly colorectal cancer, uh, and also uh, for human papillomavirus associated cancers. And so those are some of the ones we screen for now. I think that in addition to that, uh, a platform called multi-cancer early detection, where we're utilizing, uh, again, the genomic sequence. And again, not just the genes, the, the part that you inherit from your parents, but the, the, what's called the epigenomic signature, the methylation patterns. And I don't want to get too much in the weeds, but the reason your legs, your, your muscle cell knows how to be a muscle cell and your eyeball cell needs, knows how to do what it does is not because they have different DNA, it's because they have different patterns of methylation that turn off and turn on various proteins to be expressed. So the DNA is the code, and then it's going to be expressed. So I think we will, in 20 years, be in a, uh, a place, hopefully, where we have the capacity to screen for many tumors simultaneously, including unusual and rare ones. And also, they can be done uh, with blood tests which can be performed either at home. I think 20 years from now, we'll have a way for you to draw your own blood at home, do an auto phlebotomy unit. And so I, and then third part of that is that I hope that we, in 20 years, we figured out logistics so that if you're due for an annual screen, that test gets to your house every single year, a week before it's due to allow you and other people uh, to be screened. And again, for this to work, it can't just work for the wealthiest and the most uh, 
you know, rich. This has to be something that narrows our gaps and disparities and is available broadly throughout the population, both at the high socioeconomic end, but also for people who are uninsured, for people who have Medicaid, for people, and I think 20 years from now, we'll have a national health care system that'll help support that. So I, I think that it's what it, what it looks like. I think we're going to flatten the playing field and we're going to democratize screening. And hopefully we will utilize logistics to get this across the finish line. And if we don't get it across the finish line, the cancer community, Amazon will. In our first interview, we learned of your mantra, or one of your mantras, although I think this is your favorite one, that of, quote, unquote, going on offense against cancer. And biomarkers would seem to be a player on that team. What about genetic testing? To what degree do biomarkers cross paths with genetic, genetic testing? Genetic tests are biomarkers. So they're, they're, again, biomarkers is a huge umbrella over here. Hereditary cancer risk assessment and genomics uh, are further up on the uh, continuum of cancer. What they do is identify a person's risk for developing cancer based upon a hereditary component. And unfortunately, we have incredibly great tests with large panels that are available, but we have very low utilization in primary care, uh, which is really a shame because we haven't elevated it to an important enough piece that we reimburse for it, we measure it, and, and you know, sort of like, uh, you know, if, if it's worth doing, it's worth measuring. And I think that unfortunately in primary care, we really get under utilization of the family history to determine those people who are most appropriate for genetic testing. So I would, you know, ask all your listeners, you know, go online. There's many different websites where you can put in your family history, determine whether or not you meet one of the various guidelines for hereditary cancer risk. And then there's a variety of, again, that's one of the great things about genomic testing. You know, it used to be five, $10,000, $15,000 to see if you had one BRCA gene. And now you can get a wide variety of panels, you know, 50 to 100 genes for under $300. And so, again, that's the kind of change that we're seeing in here. So people need to take their family history into their own hands. I do recommend they discuss that with their doctor, right, to close that loop because you don't want to be out there just seeing Dr. Google. Uh, you want to have your real doctor involved in this. But unfortunately, you know, we don't see as broad uh, adherence as we would like to see. So again, that's why I encourage people to know your family history, take advantage of online tools, and then bring that to your physician's attention. Our guest is Whitney Jones, MD. He's the founder of the Colon Cancer Prevention Project in Louisville, Kentucky. And the subject we're talking about today is biomarkers. Now, Whitney, you've given our listeners a great deal of, of information on which they can act. But how can we get this message out on a, on a more broad, general basis? And uh, this probably involves something along the lines uh, that has nothing to do with medicine, but has more to do with marketing and, and uh, PR, that sort of thing. Well, I, I, I seldom try to give the marketers and the PRs more because people who work for companies, you know, that's all they do all day long. I, I think what we need to do is really redefine, you know, the cancer continuum because, uh, there's a great physician, Dr. Azaraza, who's an oncologist, and she talks about our focus and determination on the last cancer cell, which are people who already have established cancer, finding those therapies for stage three and stage four disease. Uh, we have no shortage of money, investment, dollars, and marketing around that. All you have to do is watch television to know that those marketing dollars are being put to work. But if you look, begin to look in front of the oncologist door, to being able to detect cancer at its earliest stages when it can be treated uh, or find a person's risk so they can undergo appropriate screening at the right time to either prevent them. Imagine a woman with a BRCA mutation who gets uh, mastectomies as a preventative way of avoiding breast cancer. Even further upstream to understand you know, what your risk may be in terms of uh, long-term that don't have to do with anything you inherited but whether you have methylation abnormalities or your telomeres are messed up or some type of predisposition, I, I think though that's, you know, there's no problem with money behind the oncologist door. Let me tell you that. The problem with investment is on the preventative side, the early detection side, and the risk side. 
And I think those are harder because they don't have a product right involved with them. And I think the threshold to get uh, approval for those uh, has tended to be very long, complicated studies that last 15 years. Some people want to have all-cause mortality reduction as a threshold for improving screening. Others look at reduction from cancer deaths as a threshold and a finish line. I think what we need to really begin to look at is stage shift. Can you diagnose these cancers for which people are at risk earlier and find them at stage one and stage two? Even stage three is better than stage four. Uh, but again, I think the issue is that screening has lagged in funding in America forever. And I don't know the exact answer to your question, but I think it has to do with leadership and a reapportionment of resources. Uh, and again, just think of this, you know, uh, you know, you know, nicotine levels in your blood are a biomarker because you know, if you're smoking cigarettes and tobacco, you're at increased risk for all the cancers that go with, with tobacco. So, but we don't need a biomarker on everybody. We just need to work on smoking reduction. So again, my idea, my philosophy is shift resources from behind the oncologist door, where again, we have lots of great therapies and innovation is boundless, and begin to invest some of those into uh, prevention and early detection. I don't know if I'm sticking my head in the lion's mouth when I rephrase my question this way, but how would you feel about more involvement in terms of this, these uh, shifting of resources? How would you feel about more involvement from the public sector? Well, I think that's, I think we've seen it. We've, we've certainly seen the public sector in, uh, you know, insurance products, except genetic testing, right? There's many uh, companies now that are looking to develop and promote uh, uh, multi-cancer early detection protocols because of improvement of tests, excuse me, uh, because now they're there. And again, I think that is the public sector, right? That is, that is uh, you know, people who've got their own business, they're out there working, they're pushing things out there. But I think, you know, I still look to leadership organizations like the American Cancer Society. I look to the Prevent Cancer Foundation, who are extremely uh, well thought of and well-respected folks who take their time, and look, but they're also willing to accelerate. For instance, in the multi-cancer detection space, there's over 300 organizations that want to accelerate uh, some of these pathways for understanding and determining whether or not these are going to be utilized broadly and covered by insurance, particularly those with Medicare who suffered the greatest burden of cancer. And so I, I think that advocacy organizations like yours, like mine, like the ACS, I think that we just need to get a little higher on our stools, talk a little louder, make sure we're discussing this with people in the governmental sector, sector who hold a lot of the funds and monies. I mean, why do we spend 95% of the NCI's budget on cancer treatment and only 5% of the NCI's budget on uh, prevention? That's a great question to ask. And that's where I like, always like to start uh, when I'm looking at it. So, um, you know, in the private in the, in the private world, we're all we're doing it right now, Bruce. You're 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 taking your dream and putting it in this into action. Now we talked about uh, individuals in the, the private sector, people like myself getting educated on this, and there may be a different answer for each governmental body you go to. But if you were to look at CDC or NIH or American Cancer Society, even though that isn't a government organization. Do you sense that they are receptive to the idea of being educated about this, or are they old dogs that need to be taught new tricks? Oh, well, I don't think they need to be educated. I think they are educated. I think that they uh, oftentimes are very methodical about the way they do data. And again, remember, we're in a transformational time with medicine. We never would have thought we would have done so much telemedicine before the COVID uh, hit. We never thought we'd have the ability to sequence whole genomes for under $1,000. And so what I've seen at the national level, and again, I, I think probably the laggard in this has been uh, the national organizations to some degree. In other words, the federal organizations. I think these uh, private uh, nonprofits have been very aggressive. In fact, they're really pushing hard to have studies. And I think the National Cancer Institute just announced they're going to do a multi-year study on multi-cancer early detection testing with over 200,000 individuals, uh, you know, and that's going to really advance the science dramatically. And 
But I'm, I'm always thinking, well, why, why is the United States a year and a half behind the National Health Service in England? Uh, everybody wants to reduce cancer deaths. Everybody wants to reduce cancer cost and treatment costs. So I, I think the system's working. It feels excruciatingly slow to me sometimes because I'm an accelerator like you. But I, but I want to I let your listeners know, I think that look into some of those organizations that not only accept, and again, you don't accept all biomarkers because they're called biomarkers. That's, that's a dictionary of biomarkers. They have to methodically go through each of these uh, various tests and determine what the appropriate relevance is. And uh, I, I think that's, I think they should. Uh, we don't want to unleash uh, untested, unvalidated tests on the public. Now, the final area I want to touch on, Whitney, is uh, something that might involve a little bit of pushback, not necessarily from me, but from people I have read and heard who look at the whole notion of biomarkers and uh, they look at it with some measure of skepticism. To those skeptics, what would you say? Let's look at the data. Let's be more afraid of advanced cancer than we are of uh, missteps in early diagnosis. No one wants to have overdiagnosis. Uh, no one wants to uh, have uh, lead, lead time bias where you're diagnosing a person earlier, but they're gonna die at the same time. Those are all true and they're gonna be there for every single cancer early detection. And they are for the ones we use right now, colonoscopy, stool testing, mammography, lung cancer screening. So let's not have a higher threshold uh, than what we're using right now. Because again, in the multi-cancer space, right now we diagnose about 15% of cancers through screening. We can potentially increase that to 50% of cancers through screening when people are asymptomatic. And particularly amongst those people who have higher levels of aggressive tumors, lung, ovary, pancreas, yeah, we all know what they are. Uh, so we have the really, we're in the middle of a paradigm shift. And I think that we're learning as we go along, but we can do adaptive uh, approval and have processes that accelerate uh, this into the uh, sector where it's gonna really go out there and help patients while we continue to study their impact. I think that's where we need to be in this new uh, accelerated world we live in. Whitney, the answer to my final question is one you've already covered in part and perhaps in whole, but I would still like you to say it one more time, even if some of this is redundant. If you had a one-on-one -on -one audience with someone and you wanted to spread the gospel of biomarkers, and if you had one overarching point that you really wanted to drive home, what would it be? I would say that uh, we need to accelerate our clinical research and our funding uh, in front of the oncologist's door to prevent and detect early cancers to avoid the fiscal and emotional and personal uh, catastrophe that is currently cancer in the United States. And I would ask them to prioritize their funding uh, further upstream where I believe it uh, can make a greater difference and have a chance for cure. Fantastic. Whitney Jones, MD of the Colon Cancer Prevention Project in Louisville, Kentucky. Thanks so much for some, uh, for some thought-provoking information, information that I hope will reach the layperson who will act on this to the extent that they can, and ultimately that can lead to better screening and better outcomes. Whitney, thanks so much for being with us in Cancer Interviews. It's my pleasure, Bruce. Always uh, great to be with you, and uh, great work on your, in, your, in your team. Thanks so much. And again, we want to remind you that if you're on any kind of cancer journey, you are not alone. There are people out there just like Dr. Whitney Jones who are there for you with information that can help you along your cancer journey for you or a loved one. So until next time, we'll see you on down the road. Thanks for joining us today. For more information, please visit us online at cancerinterviews.com. We appreciate you tuning in and we'll see you back here again next time on the Cancer Interviews Podcast.